Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters and key figures from the publishing industry. Plus loads of hints, tips and inspiration for all creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review or just tell a friend. Right, cue that new theme tune. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 128, with Jackie Cabler returning to talk about her latest best-selling psychological thriller, The Perfect Couple. She's got some inspirational words around why she writes and also gives an insight into the more positive aspects of book promotion during a global pandemic. A quick catch up from me before we get into that interview. Uh, The short film you may have heard me talking about in recent intros is now complete and out into the world, free to view on YouTube. It's a 10 minute emotional drama about two women and a Skype call that will change their lives forever. And I've really been touched by the positive feedback and kind words I've received about it so far. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too. So please check out the YouTube link in the show notes, have a watch and leave a comment. It's given me much needed boost and kind of inspired me to get back to the page again this week. I'd like to write another Skype-based piece, possibly something with a bit of humour, but I'll also be getting back to working on a TV pilot I've been developing based on the concept for one of my previous short films, Inkling. Speaking of Inkling, I also stayed up until the wee small hours this uh, past weekend to attend the online version of the Horror Hound Film Festival, where Inkling was an official selection. Not quite as good as going over to Cincinnati like I was originally planning, but, you know, things change. Um, and then I also attended the uh, the post-screening Q&A session too, and I met lots of talented writers and filmmakers. Again, it was kind of a welcome antidote to the usual self-doubt that tends to build up during the times between active projects being out in the world. I don't know whether anyone else is the same but at least that's what I find happens to me and I've spoken to other writers on the podcast before that kind of regardless of the level of their success still they sort of still develop crippling self-doubt between projects does anyone else listening feel the same well if so let me know in the comments send me a tweet at ju podcast or at mr kelly to you leave a comment on the facebook page or drop me an email at wayne at wayne kelly uk. One email I did get recently was from listener Sophie White, who's looking to focus more on her writing and particularly wants to learn more about non-fiction writing. So thanks for getting in touch, Sophie, and for the suggestion of getting a non-fic author on to give some pointers. I'll definitely be looking to do that in the near future. So if anyone has any suggestion for possible guests, do get in touch and let me know. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk to get free stuff and to be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, let's get to today's interview with Jackie Cabler. Jackie has had a long and illustrious career in broadcasting and journalism, including a nine-year stint on GMTV. She's worked freelance and for the BBC and Sky, and she currently works as a presenter on QVC in the UK. She's the creator of a successful cosy crime series, but now she's signed with HarperCollins and writes dark psychological thrillers with a debut Am I Guilty last year and now the newly released The Perfect Couple, which is currently riding high in the Amazon charts. So here's our Skype chat that we recorded just a few days ago. Okay, Jackie, thanks a million for joining me on Joined Up Writing. I really appreciate it. So, yeah, so you're in the middle of a big book launch that's going fantastic, despite what's going on in the world. So why don't you give us a sense of of where you are and and what's going on? Well, I'm talking to you from my 
home in Gloucestershire um, on the edge of the Cotswolds, lovely spot. And yeah, my fifth book came out uh, as we speak about four weeks ago. And it's gone a little bit bonkers, Wayne. I don't know what's happened. It's um, as, as I speak to you now, it's been four weeks in the Amazon top 20 most sold books. I think today is number six on the Kindle chart. It hit number one on the Kobo ebook chart. Um, and it's only the ebook that's out yet. The paperback's not even coming out till the end of June. So it's been crazy. It's been a very nice little bright spot during this weird period that we're in. Well, it's fantastic. Congratulations on the success Thank so far. You. So, yeah. So tell us about that book. It's the perfect couple, isn't it? So give us a bit of a sense of what, what the book is. It's my second psychological thriller. It's about... Um, a uh, couple, <laughs> surprise, surprise, <laughs> called Gemma, Gemma and Danny. And they live in Bristol. It's set in Bristol. And Gemma comes home from work one day and her husband is just simply not there. Um, and then she starts to find out all sorts of odd stuff about his recent past that she didn't know before and as an aside there's also a serial killer investigation running That's in Bristol a, <laughs> a little yeah <laughs> and uh, and when she goes to the police to report Danny missing um she realizes that the the other victims of the serial killer all look very like Danny somebody is killing men that look like Danny so the book sort of takes off from there brilliant and obviously as you say it's going down really really well at the moment mm. do you think there's some weird thing that is playing into the zeitgeist of what's going on or what why do you think it has been so successful do you know i wish i knew the answer to that question because i would just keep writing the same <laughs> sort of book i wish i knew i have no idea it's so weird because this book is not my favorite book i've written at all in fact i was really worried about this book mm -hmm. um coming out i just didn't I wasn't entirely happy with it, but I think as a writer, you're never entirely no. happy with anything. I, I certainly aren't. I, I certainly aren't. That's great, right? That's great grammar. I certainly am not. <laughs> I certainly aren't. I certainly um, aren't, my love. <laughs> but, um, it's the Bristol thing yeah, coming out of there. It is. Obviously, I've been... Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, what was I saying? So, yeah, I, I didn't even particularly love this book. I'll tell you what, I love it now. I love yeah, it now. I it's bet like, you do. Um, it's my favourite book ever. But um, I'm not really sure. Honestly, um, it's my second psychological thriller. So I think I've got into my stride a bit more with this one. Um, I'm with a big publisher now. My, my first three books, which I'm, we're going to talk about later, I know, but they were um, with a very small publisher. My, my current book deal is with HarperCollins. So obviously being with a, book, a bigger publisher helps, of course. Sure. Um, but I'm not really sure why this one has taken off. It's um, the reviews all talk about sort of escapism and a you know a really twisty, turny thriller that kept them gripped. And I think maybe the style of book is a good distraction for people at the moment. I know crime is selling incredibly well. Mm -hmm. If you look at the charts at the moment, it's all the crime, you know, a lot of crime books at the top of the charts. So not really sure why that is during lockdown. But but, um, and it's a funny one because because lockdown has been really difficult for lots of authors. And in fact, lots of publishers have moved publication dates to the autumn. They've cancelled sort of spring publication dates and changed them to autumn because all the bookshops are closed. And, yeah. you know, it's a really difficult time to bring out a book. But my publisher decided to stick and see what happens. And, you know, obviously for me, that's been a good decision. But it was a, an absolute shocker it was such a surprise to me that this book has taken off as it has and i don't really know why i don't really know why is the answer but you know i'm not complaining but let's not complain here let's not, <laughs> no. let's not deconstruct it too much so what kind of inspired the book where did the kind of initial germ of the idea come from do you think um I was sort of, do you know, it was one of those really what if moments as, you know, lots of authors say, what if this happened? What if that happened? And I was just tossing around ideas for my next book out in the garden um, about two summers ago. And just my husband was at work and I remember thinking, gosh, what if he came home from work and I just wasn't here? You know, where would I have gone? What would I have, what would I be doing? And then I turned it around in my head and I thought, no, actually, wouldn't it be more interesting if I came home from work and he was gone? How would I react? You know, what would I do? What would I think? Uh -huh. And then imagine if I started to find out all sorts of stuff about my husband that I never knew. And it, it sort of took off from there, really. Um, so it's just a very simple, yeah, just a very simple, what if this happened? And it turned into a, a book. Brilliant. So it's another standalone. And as you say, it's on the darker side of crime. It's psychological thriller sort of thing, as opposed to your early cosy crime books in the Cora Baxter series. So do you do you think this will be your main direction from now, especially given the success that you've just had? 
Very much so, yeah. I mean, my first three books, as you say, were were cosy crime. It was about they were about a television news reporter who got involved with solving murder mysteries, but there was a lot of romance and humour in there as well. But even as I was writing those books, I remember just having this urge to write something darker. Certainly, by the time I'd written my third Cora Baxter, I just wanted to make it darker and could, kind of couldn't because I had to stick to the cosy crime formula. Um, and there were, that was a sort of two pronged thing. One, I just had the urge to write something dark. I wanted to explore darker themes and slightly more gory, gory crimes <laughs> and so on. I don't know what that says about me. Um, but also, and we've talked about this before, it was it was a commercial decision. It was a cynical decision because Cozy Crime, although I really enjoy it, it doesn't have a massive audience, certainly in the UK. It's bigger in, in the States. Um, it's taking off in France, apparently now. But in the UK, it's not a massive genre. There are people who love it. And those books definitely had a very loyal audience, but it was quite a small audience. Mm-hmm. Um, so... And you don't really tend to see cosy crime that much in the book charts, high up in the book charts and so on. So partly I wanted to write something darker, but also I wanted to write something that I thought might sell a few more copies (laughs) because that's kind of part. I mean, I write for the love of it without a doubt. And I would write even if I never made a single penny. But it is part of the decision to write a book is that you hope it's going to do well and you hope you might sell a few copies, you know. So um, it was partly a commercial decision. And I, I read a lot of psychological thrillers and and sort of more hardcore crime it's my favorite genre and I just thought I'd give it a go and the first one that I wrote was called Am I Guilty and that came out last year and that was my first book with Hop Collins and yeah that one did okay that one did okay um and it sort of got me into that genre and then this new one is is sort of my second attempt and this is the one that's really really taken off a bit so I'm so grateful for that and I'm so glad I made that decision actually because I feel that this is the right genre for me now I feel very comfortable in it Um, I enjoy writing the books um, because I enjoy reading this kind of book Mm -hmm. so I'm sort of creating the type of books that I like to read really which is a great which I think which is which is nice yeah yeah so what I mean obviously you you change genre but you were also writing a series originally and these are standalone books at least so far I don't know whether you've got any plans for a series further down the line but what what do you think are the pros and cons with that I mean has it crossed your mind to write a series but that's in a kind of darker you know uh, a, a darker psychological thriller or crime type thing Yeah possibly I mean at the moment I'm I'm contracted to write standalones but um that certainly in The Perfect Couple, the, the police officers involved, quite a few people have said they'd love to see those police officers come back again. So I could easily bring them back in, in other in other standalone stories, but with the same police officers, if yeah, you know what yeah, I mean. So, yeah, they could, yeah. that, so it could sort be of a sort of a, Yeah, exactly. So that that's a, maybe a possibility down the line. I don't know. I mean, it is a very different beast. Writing a series in some ways is easier because you already know your characters. Mm -hmm. So once you've created the cast of characters in book one, they just come back fully formed in book two, book three, etc. So you don't really have to create new characters. Obviously, you create new baddies and so on, but your core cast of characters remains the same. So for me, that was much easier. It was just like slipping into an old pair of slippers, you know, (laughs) comfortable old slippers. And and you've got the same characters there. You know what they'll do. You know what they'll say. You know how they'll behave. So it is easier. Having said that, it gets maybe a little bit repetitive. And I quite like now writing standalones and creating a new cast of characters for each book. I find that quite exciting. And I'm sort of sitting in my at my desk right now and I'm looking at my notice board where I'm working on my next book. And I've got all these pictures and all these characteristics of all the different characters. And they're all quite new to me. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm quite like getting to know you. That's so great. it's uh, it is it is it's very different writing standalones. But I think I'm enjoying it for the moment. Yeah. So you, soon as you mentioned it there, you, your office and where you are now in your space. So you've kind of got, so you, you, I know like some people collect things digitally and they use Scrivener and they put like little pictures in different pieces, but you like to get like pictures of things and you like to put it up and create yeah. this sort of, so, I mean, obviously you can't give away what you're writing at the moment, I'm guessing, or any specific things, but so examples, do you find like actors and different bit, bits and pieces? What, what are you kind of using to build up this kind of visual um, library of stuff and, and things that kind of give you a clue as as regards who you're writing about and what you're writing about? 
Well, I'm really old school. I, I know people rave about Scrivener and I know you like it, don't you? But yeah. and so many people do. But I've never I don't use anything like that. I'm totally old school. I've got um, a card index on my desk with all the chapters <clears throat> written yeah. down and what's in each chapter. But on my notice board, my notice board is like the hub. It's the hub of the book. So on my notice board right now, I've got, yes, I've got all my different characters and I've got all their basic details, how old they are what they look like and what I do to really help me visualize what they look like is if I've got a so say one of my characters she's a 60 year old woman um I basically google images yeah, for 60 year old women for 60 yeah. year old women do you yeah and I, and I and I just find and I google maybe hundreds of images until I find one that kind of matches the picture I have in my head and then I print yeah. that out and I stick that on the board and that becomes my uh, 60 year old woman in my book and some of these people are ac accidentally celebrities I had Wayne Rooney on my <laughs> on my board for quite a while at one point because um that was that was a bit weird but um he just looked like the sort of character I wanted to have so some of them are just models probably I don't know who they are they're just random people who'd probably be shocked to find themselves pinned to my board but but they really help me to visualize and then I've got maps as well and I've got pictures of houses. So if I if I need to have a house in my book, I want to really see what that house looks like. So I just Google pictures of houses and I, I've got a picture of a house. I've got maps, um, street maps of city centres. I've got maps of sort of wider areas. So I don't because I like to get things like road names and so on. Right. Yeah. And um, sometimes I make up road names. If it's going to be a particularly unsavory thing happening, I'll make up a road name so people yeah, don't compl yeah. complain that I. Yeah put the value of the house down or something <laughs> but um but generally I like to have if I'm talking about an area I like to kind of get it roughly right because people get a bit annoyed if you have it wrong so yeah it's, it's I've got a calendar on there as well to try and keep my dates straight because that can be a right pain oh can, yeah it can timeline you know, is a horrendous yeah, yeah. you know people being pregnant for 12 months and things like yeah, that which, yeah. which isn't ideal so um yeah so it's, it's a very busy board and it looks really odd and this my writing room also doubles as my spare bedroom so when people come to stay I've got <laughs> I've got a very sophisticated system of covering up all my weird notes which is a plastic tablecloth Brilliant. which I pin to the notice board so nobody can peek do you think yes. they ever do peek when you're not looking when you well, suppose you can really do anything I would about know it. Yeah. I would know because I pin it very, very specifically. <laughs> I have a specific pattern of pins. That is brilliant. That I pin it with. Yes. So I'm very high tech here. Plastic tablecloths and card indexes. Hey, if it works, that's that's yeah. fine. I know. I definitely know what you mean. I mean, I I do use Scrivener and I do like Scrivener, but equally, I do find sometimes moving things around and touching things with my hands and actually looking at actual physical things does help especially uh, to be honest i found it more with writing scripts particularly with like longer um scripts index cards for for scenes and things um really help because especially when you're writing a script or whatever you know you can really mess about with the structure i mean you can in a book as well but obviously yeah. because you can yeah. just cut from one thing to another and you can have you know flashbacks or whatever it kind of lends itself to that so I think if you start thinking in those ways, and I, I use like index cards and, and I can just sort of lay them out and then start shuffling them around and thinking what happens mm. if that goes to that, that's much easier to do. And you can do that in Scrivener kind of on the digital, the corkboard thing, but it's not the same to, for me anyway. No. Um, no, and if you're not very technical, I mean, you know how much trouble we had setting up this Skype call, <laughs> Wayne, from from my end. So, so when you're not very technically minded, yeah, I think paper is much easier. I still use a paper diary. I still use a file of facts. I don't ever have. I don't even have a calendar on my phone. I oh, use my file of facts. So I'm a bit of a school. dinosaur. I know. Well, if it my thing is if it works, regardless anyway. I mean. Some people get sort of, I've had people sort of getting preemptively angry at me because I like Scrivener as if I'm saying you have to have Scrivener or you have to use a bit of software. I don't care. It's like, it's fine. All I'm saying is I, I use it and I mm. find it useful for writing books because it, I, I like the way that it's set out and I've not got this huge document or whatever, but that's fine. If you prefer Word or you prefer a typewriter or pen and paper, whatever it happens to be, it doesn't matter. I, I think as long as it works, it's great. Exactly. So whatever exactly. works for you is yeah. uh, is is kind of uh, yeah know, how it should be. So there are no rules. Yeah, absolutely. The only rule is there there are no rules. Um, yeah. 
So let's just touch on the you know the dreaded corona word that's hanging over everything i know you've kind of been um you've been working at your day job throughout as far as i'm mm-hmm. aware of have sort of seen you tweet yeah. and stuff about it and you socially distancing but the the show must must go on and all that sort of thing um but how have you found it from sort of a creative point of view because lots of creatives that i've spoken to and lots of people online are sort of saying and I've struggled with it to a certain ex- extent, sort of concentrating, staying focused on one thing has been my um, kind of difficulty. What? How have you found it? How has it impacted you, your working process or your concentration? Yeah, it's been really difficult. And as you say, I think everyone's feeling the same, really. Um, certainly for the first few weeks of lockdown, I couldn't write at all. And I didn't write at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was. it was just partly because everything was so weird, wasn't it? And as you say, I was... I have been working throughout, albeit on reduced hours and, you know, in a very different working environment with most people working from home. So it's been work. It took a while to adjust to a new way of working. Um, but then, of course, you're you're anxious about your family, I was worried about my, you know, my family, my friends. I had a couple of friends who were very, very poorly with the virus and um, thankfully they have recovered. But, you know, it was all very weird and worrying. Um, so the first few weeks I did nothing. Um, and I didn't beat myself up about that because I thought, you know, the world is in a funny state and, and you can't, you know, worry about things like that. Mm. There are more important things to worry about. But then, um, then I entered a little bit of a, a middle phase of lockdown where I, I did write a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but then my new book came out. And so since then, I've kind of been just doing trying to do promotional stuff for that in yeah. again in a very different way. Um, so really, it's been a period of not much writing, I would say. Um, my deadline for my next book isn't until the end of the year. So I'm telling myself I've got lots of time. But of course, time has a habit of yeah, running away, away with you. I'll, yeah. pro- I'll probably get to September and go into a blind panic. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to I am going to try and get back into it in the next few weeks. But it has been tricky, hasn't it? I think so many writers on, I've seen on social media saying I just can't write at the moment it's weird yeah I mean I'm probably the same as you I think particularly at the beginning I was struggling I felt like mm. oh I've kind of got this time that I don't normally have um because I'm you know I work I work full time and I'm, I've got a busy job I'm in video production and stuff and I'm here there and everywhere and I, I don't really get this much time and so this it's a weird feeling it's kind of like a guilt thing you think well I've got this time so I should be using it and I have to be super productive and I have to be you know I should be churning out scripts and books and all sorts of different things yeah. which probably like you say is is unreasonable on yourself but um yeah I struggled with that and what I found was I had such a desire to be I've got to be I've got to be productive I've got to do all these different things that I did I struggled to focus on one thing I'd be doing something and thinking I probably could be doing this as well or I should maybe I should be doing this maybe this is not the thing that I should be focusing on um you know so I struggled with that but I, I think I've kind of like a lot of people I've kind of settled into it but what what about sort of long term do you think because again another question that's being asked both with with uh with books but films and all sorts of different um kind of media is in terms of books that I mean obviously you'll be writing a book at the moment that that's kind mm. of ongoing that you're going to be delivering for the end of the year but beyond that do you think you'll be referencing what's going on in your work in any way or do you think people will be avoiding it or how do you think that's going to pan out? I think that's a really interesting question. In fact, I've read an article about this the other day. I think um, some publishers are actually saying to authors, please don't put it in your book, certainly not at the moment, because I think once you've lived through something like this, which has been quite traumatic in many ways, you don't really want to read about it. You want to read for escapism so some publishers have actively told their authors not to write any coronavirus related books um others i think have have said the opposite um but i think the ones who are saying the opposite are a smaller group um and i think i I can't remember where i read this article it might have been in the bookseller or in one of the one of the book magazines recently saying that actually the prediction for the next certainly the next year or two is going to be feel good and escapism fiction rather than um coronavirus related fiction and having said that having said that i have seen that a couple of books have um, been very hastily it seems um put together um that are related to lockdown things to do in lockdown and a couple of other books that have been commissioned over Mm. the last few weeks and so people are obviously writing lockdown related books but um i don't know it's it's hard to predict but I, I, my feeling is that i certainly wouldn't particularly want to read a book set in lockdown mm-hmm. having lived <laughs> through it um so it'll be interesting to see what happens but i certainly will not be referencing it in my books in fact um i think what i'm going to do my 
book that I'm writing right now is set in 2020, but I might change the, the year <laughs> yeah. of the book just so, or although I suppose you can just, you know, pretend that it never happens and still set it's it in difficult. 2020. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think partly it's probably to do with what kind of books you write in the genre. I suppose yeah. my, my thing, I think if you were writing, say, I don't know, like say a Rebus novel or something like that, I, I think it would be difficult to to not at least reference it like to put something in uh, that references what's going on as regards like social distancing and stuff like that because I mean I'm using Rebus as an example because I know Mm. I know Ian Rankin often kind of references even if it's kind of obliquely stuff that's happened in like Scottish politics or you know I know that a lot of his jumping off points are often from newspaper stories and different bits and pieces and it's kind of his character seems you know he, he, he he's based in a real place and he goes to real pubs that actually exist and you know all that sort of stuff so to me it would probably seem a bit strange if it wasn't referenced but I I agree with you about I think unless you've got a specific story and something's really specific that that actually speaks to the what's actually going on you probably don't need to you know yeah and it's interesting that that, it's interesting that a lot of the or none of the soaps for example Coronation Street or EastEnders or any of them have referenced it have they they're just apparently they're going to though oh are they yeah I suppose they're running running episodes now that they shot before exactly yeah. i think they're gonna have to do i think it's the only way that mm-hmm. they can do it because they're gonna have to socially distance during yeah. the filming of it so they're gonna have to explain why characters are two meters away from each other right yeah it's gonna so, be weird isn't yeah. it but so, isn't it weird now watch because i'm a big cory fan and i find it so weird watching it seeing them hugging and kissing i'm going no i just you know, I, we find from that from other. everything we, we yeah. everything we, we're watching like old things we're like what re-watching things we've seen before me and my yeah. wife and we're still watching it and going oh god look at that crowded yeah. scene we're sort of thinking i know well, it looks it's terrible weird. you know i mean we did we are a bit masochistic and we did actually watch uh re-watch contagion the other day oh no yeah <laughs> really but it, it was oh. interesting watching it though because actually the virus in that is much 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 worse than the coronavirus yeah. and also it was interesting them talking about things like the R rate and all this sort of thing. When I would have, when I would have watched that, however many years ago it was when it first came mm-hmm. out, I wouldn't have. That would have been the first time I'd ever heard that, and it would have kind of probably of course, gone over my head yeah. a bit. But I'm like, we know about this now. They talk about it every day <laughs> on the, you know, on the briefings and everything. So <laughs> it was, um, it was strange from that point of view. But yeah, I totally get what you mean. I mean, I think it's going to be interesting, like with things like I saw a, a meme or something yesterday about romance, saying you know a scene will yeah. begin with she did, she seductively removed her gloves and mask <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant i do i do wonder how people are going to manage dating um in the you know the yeah. next little while i mean what do you do if you're if you're out there and trying to find love it's well, tricky yeah. time isn't I, it? <laughs> I saw one of my facebook friends that's a dad of a teenage daughter and he said now he says now the lockdown's been eased my daughter can go out and meet her boyfriend but she has to stay two meters apart and oh, well. And it has to be outside because this is great as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's weird. It's yeah. such weird times. It is such a weird time. But one of the things mm-hmm. that you did mention that's kind of a kind of a more of a positive spin on it before we got on mm-hmm. it was you talked about the kind of impact that it's had from the point of view of pr- promoting your book, and you're in a you're in a, in a promotional um, part of getting your book out into the world at the minute, and obviously you've had to find lots of other ways of getting it out. I mean, this is obviously a podcast and those kind of things have been around for ages and you've done those before, but what, what other types of things have you been doing that perhaps, you know, have been a change from how you would do it under normal circumstances? There's been quite a few things actually. And I, I really see that these are positive things and that can be carried on in the future, really. I think everyone has found a lot more ways to do things online. I mean, so many people working from home and these apps like Zoom and House Party I've never heard of them before yeah. before lockdown and now we're all using them all the time for meetings and so on so yeah I've done a few things online and they've worked really well and because you know normally I would have had I would probably have had some sort of a, a book launch party I would probably have done maybe some literary festivals and um, I've done library events before when books have come out so all of that of course is gone so you can't do anything at all in the real world but what I have done and what I've had really good responses have been various online things so um, I've done a Harper Collins has an online book club. Mm-hmm. So I've done um, a live, a fa- it was a Facebook live um, using an app called Be Live. And it meant three of us could be on screen together, which is really great. And it, yeah. worked, it worked brilliantly, actually. I'd never, I'd never heard of this app before either. 
Um, and so the, we had a really lovely, like a, a book club discussion with me and my editor and um, a girl called Melanie who, who hosted the book club. And that went really well. And that was an hour and we had lots and lots of people interacting with that and, um, you know, buying the book and so on. And then I did another, almost like a, a literary festival where you'd have a panel with authors. And mm-hmm. um, so I did one with another author. Um, oh, and I was such a fangirl. It was C.L. Taylor, Callie oh, yeah, Taylor. yeah. Yeah. who is so incredible and has written I've read every single one of her books and suddenly I'm being asked to do um, an author panel with C.L. Taylor I was like yes 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 yes, yes. Um, and that was really fun so I got to do a and um, it was it worked really well because both, both of our books are set in Bristol and both of our books are out more or less at the same time so her new book Strangers had just come out and my book had just come out both set in Bristol so it kind of worked quite well as a duo and uh, so I did a little again live I think that was live on Facebook as well, but then it was put onto all the social media platforms. I think it was on Instagram and Twitter and everywhere. Um, and she put it on her YouTube channel. And, you know, so it, we, it got out there to, to lots of different platforms. And it was like a little literary festival panel, um, which we did online from our respective homes. So that was really good. And then I did, um, there's a, a newsreader reporter in Scotland called Rachel McTavish. And mm-hmm. she, she's she been, because she's not been working during lockdown, she has been doing something called Shedcast, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is like a, a TV talk show from her shed, brilliant. which was brilliant. So I got to go on that. And then she's put that out on all her social media. So again, it's all Envision stuff, you know, like a little talk show. And, yeah. and um, I think, I think, Graham Norton's been doing a similar thing, hasn't he, with his yeah, show? Yeah, he has, yeah. He's been doing it, yeah. So it's that kind of style of thing. So I did that um, and appeared on that and, and chatted on that about the new book. So all these things would probably never have happened if it wasn't for lockdown. And um, we'd probably be trying to do them in the real world. And But it's so immediate and so easy to do. And as long as you've got an internet connection and something, to, you know, a laptop or a tablet or something, you can, you can do these things. So I'm hoping that that will change um life a little bit for authors after lockdown and we can do a lot more online stuff because everyone's a bit more savvy at doing these things now and we've got all these great apps so yeah that's been really good actually yeah i think i I agree i think and across society in general you mentioned the working from home thing i mean there's Mm. so many companies i mean i've been well i'm officially I'm, i'm furloughed from my job at the moment but when i before just before lockdown i actually started working from home brought my edit suite home and all that sort of stuff i can't go out and i mean obviously i can't film from home although no i'm a fan i found a way around that recently but i mean in terms of actually going out and filming stuff i have to go out and film or whatever but um editing and stuff there isn't really any reason that i need to go into an office in the middle of a city mm. um to go and do it we've got an inter- a good internet connection and all that sort of stuff so and uh, there's a, there's companies that we've been working with over the years and they've they've got like multiple really really big premises with you know more than 100 staff in them and they've already said that one of one of the companies we work with they've already said that one of their big premises they're just going to let the lease run out and they're not wow. people are going to work wow. from home because mm-hmm. it's worked fine they were worried about it before thinking that people would not be as efficient and that would probably, mm-hmm. you know, skive off and all the other things that they think people do. But I think the reality yeah. is with software and things anyway now, especially for call center and things, they know when they're on, when they're online or when they're not online and how many calls the answer and everything mm-hmm. else. So I don't really see yeah. why we should be no, it's great. going to the rush think... hour and the environment exactly. and everything else. I mean, we've seen the positive effects on the environment, haven't we? You know, I see it yeah. on my I drive to work. I, you know, the all the pollution levels have gone down. Mm. It is there. Are, there are definitely positives. If you can find positives in bad things, there are definitely some to come out of this. Yeah. So I think for everyone, not just writers. Yeah, life has definitely changed. Yeah, definitely. Mm. So um, one of the other things that I wanted to ask you, and it's kind of, I guess it's kind of similar to I've asked, I've asked you. I'm sure I've asked other people before about. Um, biggest kind of roadblock and all that kind of thing that you've faced but this is slightly different I wondered what the last can you remember the the most recent sort of moment of creative crisis or self-doubt while you're working on a project and that could be it could Mm. be a plot problem it could be oh my god this book is absolutely terrible why am I bothering with it but what can you remember what that was and, and how did you deal with it and how do you deal with those types of things in general yeah, there's a couple of things that that instantly spring to mind, actually. Yeah, as I said, um, my current book, The Perfect Couple, certainly wasn't my favourite book that I'd written. Um, I think my last book, Am I Guilty, was sort of my favourite book. But, And I'm not really sure where that was. Um, 
there were quite there were some quite major edits in the first round of edits um, that we had to do. We, we my editor basically didn't want to change the person responsible for the murder, but she wanted to change the motivation for that um, and that really made a lot of major changes in the book um, and I just I don't know what I, I don't know I just didn't feel entirely comfortable I mean I'm really happy with the way the book turned out and I do think it is better for it but while I was doing those changes I was really anxious about it and mm-hmm. I just wasn't sure I could I could make it good mm-hmm. um, and so I kind of although I could see at the end that the book was definitely definitely better for the suggested changes I was still been really insecure about it and then what happens then is the book goes on NetGalley and for those who aren't familiar with NetGalley, NetGalley is a site where books are released before publication, quite a few months before publication usually and they can be accessed by professional reviewers Mm -hmm. and bloggers so and you get librarians and people like that so anyone who's kind of a professional reader Mm-hmm. gets to gets to read the book first and then gets to leave reviews and they're just on this site and what that does is is obviously gives the author and the publisher an indication of how the book will be received once it's out there in the world once mm-hmm. it's released and so on and oh it's so stressful it's well, horrible because it it, yeah. because it's the first time anyone apart from you and your editor and maybe your agent has seen the book um and the first couple of reviews for that book on NetGalley were dreadful. They were dreadful. Right. And it, I was like, no, because I, I knew this was, I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, my goodness. Now, thankfully, then they started to improve and, and the next few were OK. But but oh, my goodness, that I had for the first few days when there was only a couple of dreadful reviews and they were really dreadful. I mean, <laughs> the, the two that really spring to mind both involved fire for some reason. And um, one of them said that the plot was OK, but the characters were so dim and useless they wouldn't notice if their own heads were on fire <laughs> which was nice and the second one said that the woman she hated the book so much that she wanted to throw her kindle out of the window and set it on fire for good measure oh my god <laughs> i know they were brutal and um, now i can laugh now you see i can laugh now because i can think laugh actually but you know you do yeah. remember them both very very I well i remember them and- both Almost word for word. And I suspect and you don't remember, yeah, you know, the good ones. Any, any of no. the hundreds that, that you've no. had that are fantastic. Yeah. No, that's that's true. Um, so when your first few, few reviews are that bad, you just think, <laughs> oh, no, this is such a turkey. I've written the worst book in the world. Um, Especially when it, it kind of plays into you'd already got a doubt yes, about it. I was it. already yeah. insecure about it. And then this happened and it was just horrendous, which is why now this, you know, the fact that it's done so well is even sweeter because yeah. this is not not the book that I thought would, would be the one that would sort of be a bit of a game changer. Um, it really isn't. So... Yeah, that was awful. And it it is really hard to deal with that. And reviews are something that has taken me really five books to kind of finally now be able to think, okay, everyone gets bad reviews. You know, you have if you 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 look at the best selling books out there and they've all got some terrible reviews and you just have to remember that and not take it personally. And remember that you don't like every book you've ever ever read. I certainly don't, you know. Um, and so you you just have to suck them up. It's part of the job, and that's that. And you have to develop a thick skin. But it isn't easy, and it isn't. It, it's it's horrible. It's it's gut wrenching. You know, it's awful when it happens. But um, yeah, that wasn't that wasn't nice. But it's turned around. It's fine. It's all good. You see, it's a lesson not to panic about <laughs> about a few bad reviews because it can work out in the end. So how did I mean? Presumably, your editor is too polite to say no, 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 no. I told you so, but um, <laughs> I told you that this was the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, I mean, obviously, that's a quite a specific example. And you said you were just in, mm. you just had this general kind of malaise, and you're a bit worried about mm. it. But how do you approach it when you get a, a problem? Where I mean, I don't, I can't remember from when we talked before how specifically you plot your books beforehand or whether you do just find your way but do you even even when you plot a book you can still write your way into a corner can't you You can still especially if you're writing something that's twisty and turny and got lots of things going different directions and lots of moving parts have you found you've written yourself into a difficult situation and then thought oh my god how the hell am I gonna get this I have that's happened a few times actually um it happened it actually happened with the end. Uh, was it the end? Was it this book? Yeah, it was this book. Um, the perfect couple. I 
I really messed up the end. The first before my editor even saw it, this was in an early stages. I, I just had no idea how to end it, mm-hmm. and um, and then I thought, oh no, am I going to have to go back and change loads of things to get a proper satisfactory yeah, ending? Feeling, and yeah. yeah, it was just awful, and um, and it was really weird. I, I've I've realised that, and I think actually there is some science behind this. Mm-hmm. I can't remember exactly, but I've often heard that if you really are struggling with a plot point or you know you've you've written yourself into a corner and you're just sitting at your desk tearing your hair out and you just cannot you cannot think your way out of it what you really need to do is go and physically move this sounds really odd but go and walk or go and run or go on a bike whatever it is and physically move your body and that kind of frees up your mind and i've definitely read that somewhere I mean, more I, than yeah once. So i've, that, I've read it more a, than once it's, yeah it's actually one of the things i was kind of going to say because i know that you run yeah. for example i'm a big runner yeah and, and I, I remember that day that i just my ending was just completely doing my head in and i thought I've, i don't know i've messed this up so badly i don't know how to end this book and i just gave up and i went out for a run and it really weirdly within minutes of pounding those pavements it came to me I just thought that's what I do it's so obvious that's how I end it um so that's what I d- try and do now it doesn't always work that quickly but I think sometimes you have to just get away from the desk and, and let your almost let your subconscious work on it while you're doing something else um but yeah it's it's a horrible feeling when you when you just think you've messed it up and you can't work out how to get out of it but you can you it's your book and you can and always work your way out of it you just have to you take can. your time and, and like you say it. a lot of the thing yeah you, you kind of alluded to it there was that it's that i've definitely had it it's that fear where you sort of know mm. that you can yeah. change it and you you know that you can fix it but the other part of you knows that when you make that one little change because the thing about a novel you change one thing in a novel it's the ripple oh. effect it's like the back oh, to the future thing yeah. you know it changes all all of time it's like that it's like one thing you do and then totally. i mean I, i've had things where i've thought when I'm doing it, I think, oh, this is actually a really small thing. This is not a problem. And then as soon as I start mm. thinking about the ramifications of it and actually mm-hmm. reading through the edit and going, oh, no, it changes that, which then changes that, which then changes that, which then changes that. And yeah. just on and on you go. And before you know it, you feel like you're having to rewrite the whole Well, book. that was, yeah, that was one of the other things my editor asked me to do. She felt that my lead character in The Perfect Couple, Gemma, was a bit lonely. So she said, could you give her either a baby or a dog? <laughs> so or I a, thought, Or well, a baby dog. <laughs> or a baby dog so um i thought a baby would just really change the story far too much so i thought i'll give her a dog yeah. but that sounds like a very small thing but my goodness that dog has to be somewhere throughout yes. the whole book yes. she has to feed the dog and she has to walk the dog and she can't just forget about the dog for six chapters because people will go where's the dog yeah so and you know and she if she has to go away the dog has to go into kennels or someone has to look after it and then she has to pick it up again when she comes back and it actually it's actually a massive change to stick a dog in a book completely um, but, yeah but i did it but there is now a dog in the book but yes um so yes as you say small things can mean a massive amount of work that you just don't realize at the time i i, I the dog things actually come up before with um another author spoke to jonathan digby he's he he put um he's got a dog the dog that's in his book is actually based on his actual dog um and he said he thought this would be a really nice thing and there's a bit of a name check and blah 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 it's a historical fiction that he writes but he said Mm. Yeah, when he came back to the edit, he was like, hang on a minute, where's the dog? Yeah, <laughs> where's, yeah, exactly. Where's the dog? And when the dog was in a scene, he was constantly having to find new little things because the yes, dog obviously the can't. Dog to be yeah, doing. yeah, because yes. the dog can't suddenly yes. just interrupt the conversation or whatever. Well, it can bark, but you know, it's, it's like, what what is the dog doing? You know, you sort no, of the just dog give has a brush to, stroke. Yeah. The dog has to put his head on her knee or he yeah. has to, you know, he has to whimper or he has to wag his tail or he has to go to his bed or, yeah, it's huge. It's a, it's a bizarre thing, yeah. It's a massive thing. So <laughs> so as we sort of move to wrapping things up, I know this probably seems like a bit of a, a, a deep question, but what what do you think keeps you coming back to the blank page time after time? You're obviously five books in now and you've got more, more in the pipeline. Mm-hmm. Um and you've got a busy day job and everything else, you know, you really don't have to do this. So what is it that keeps you coming back to the blank page time after time? Yeah, it is a deep question. I mean, there's a quote that I love about, it's actually about running and it's, I can't remember the name of the lady, but she's an American, um, very successful American distance runner. Uh And the quote is, um, nothing has ever broken my heart like running and yet I can't breathe without it. Mm -hmm. And I honestly feel like that about writing. Yeah. Um, I have to do it. I just kind of have to do it. I, I don't feel right 
if I'm not writing, if I don't have a writing project, I, I feel twitchy, I feel anxious. I just always have to have just part of me. I, you know, I can't say it any more complicated way than that, really. And and it is, and it can be heartbreaking. It can, you know, when you get those awful reviews about people wanting to set their Kindle on fire. <laughs> it's, so, it's so, it's not, it's not a good day. But at the same time, there are enough positives to make it absolutely worth carrying on. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of just have to do it. And and I think it's, and I think it's the also now the knowledge that with persistence and hard work can come success. Yeah. I was, um, you mentioned Ian Rankin earlier, and I'm a huge Ian Rankin fan. And he has always, I love his books. I've read every single one yeah, of them, but he's also personally really inspired me because I once read an article about him and and he said that he had written seven Rebus books with very little success and he was about to be dropped by his publisher. Mm -hmm. And it was the eighth, it was his eighth book that Mm -hmm. suddenly took off. And I thought, my goodness, if if somebody of his stature and, you know, his immense global reach now can, can have seven books that didn't really do anything and then suddenly his eighth book takes off. And I thought that really inspired me to just keep writing. And also Paula Hawkins, for example, um, Girl on the Train, I think was her fifth book. And she'd written four books, sort of romance books before that, that again, really hadn't done very much. And and suddenly her, her fifth book is a global bestseller. So people like that inspire me to keep writing as well. And you think, well, you know, you never know which book it's going to be that's going to take off. And, and, you know, finally, I've had one that's taken off a bit. And, and it's all worth it. It's worth every minute of hard work when you see your book at the top of the Kindle chart. You know, it's it's amazing. So that's what keeps me writing. I, I have to write. I love writing. And, um, you know, you just never know what's going to happen with writing. That's the exciting thing about it. It's brilliant. Yeah. That's that's really inspiring. So what? So as we kind of wrap things up, so what? So can you give us a sense of what's up next, and also tell people where they can find out more about you and your books? Yes, and actually, I should have said something else I did during lockdown was I've started a book club on Instagram. Oh, great! Um, which has been which has been brilliant. I should have mentioned that. Um, I decided to start a little book club um, just to kind of connect with readers, and and I love reading as well as writing, and you know I read a lot, and I thought it'd be nice to share. Because people are reading a lot more during lockdown, obviously, to share what I'm reading and hear what other people are reading, and, and it's really taken off. It's been brilliant. We've got thousands of people involved. So yeah, so I've got a I've got an Instagram account um, with a new book club. If anyone wants to to join us, and uh, uh, that's my Instagram name. As I've told you before, is official Jackie Cabler because there was a fake yeah, fake Jackie yeah. Cabler on there when I first Some weird joined. Jackie Cabler. <laughs> Some weird, person, weird, yeah. weird person. Um, so at official Jackie Cabler, I've got a book club. And um, but yes, um, apart from the ongoing book club, I am. Um, working on my next book um for hob collins which will be uh, i'm not i don't have a date yet i have to have it delivered by the end of the year and it's another standalone so i will get back to that at some point and uh keep writing that um and yeah my books are all obviously on amazon and if the bookshops ever open again <laughs> hopefully in some bookshops as well I'm sure they will um be. I hope so. Yeah, I think that's and, imminent. Uh, actually, I think bookshops are. Going yeah, to be. I think so. Which is which is really good. And I'm on Twitter at Jackie Campbell. So all very simple, simple social media handles. Well, it's brilliant mm. to talk to you again. As you said, the third time. I think. Yeah. I think I think three is the record. I think you've got that. That's equal with. I think there's at least one other person that's done three. But no one's done more than three yet. So, the <laughs> next book, Jackie, you have to come back on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honoured. Oh, it's a pleasure. And everyone listening should watch Wayne's short films as well. The one that you've just released about lockdown. It was called Life Support. Is oh, amazing. You. That's very kind. Check out yeah. check out Wayne's social media. It is honestly brilliant. You're very talented. Oh, so. I really appreciate. It. Well, I hope. I also hope on that very subject. Hope you don't mind. I actually actually nicked your Twitter quote and put it on the little teaser that I've just put out of yeah. the uh, little trailer. Put it on the end there. So feel free. No, it's so brilliant. Appreciate that. That's uh, that's great. Well, Jackie, it's been brilliant. To talk to you thanks very much for um giving up your saturday morning to chat to me and um i hope all the success with the perfect couple continues because richly deserved thank you so much it's lovely to talk to you take care
Okay, thanks again to Jackie, and do make sure you check out The Perfect Couple, which is out right now. I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That's it for this week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. You can also find us on YouTube, and make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts to have the podcast downloaded automatically every week. Also remember to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever because it does really help others to find the show or you can just tell a friend. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing, stay safe and I'll see you next time.